Lord, I thank you for the, the people who love you so much, those that are watching online, uh, who are not in the building, but Lord, for those that just uh, wanted to be in this building. There's something different when we're in the building together, and I thank you for Mark that's working with our youth downstairs, bring blessing upon them as well. We pray for New Holland Baptist Church. We pray your blessings upon us for all those that are seeking to uh, uplift your kingdom's work. So Father, just uh, great times, wonderful times, glorious times. But Lord, help us tonight to see your work and what you do, probably that we're not always so pleased with. We need to be honest about it, but it's best. So Lord, we thank you for that. So uh, open our eyes to let us see your word. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. If you have your Bibles, turn to 2 Corinthians chapter number 12. We've been in a series called The God of the Resurrection, and we've gone through the people in the Old Testament and the New Testament where there was a literal person who died who was resurrected. And then we talked about um, Christ when he, was, when he died and was resurrected. We talked about those that would, uh, when Christ returns, those that would be resurrected then. We talked about heaven, and we talked about the place that was called hell. We talked about the place that was called the lake of fire. And, you know, when we talk about heaven, we'd all like to get a good glimpse of it, wouldn't we? How many of y'all like to see 20 seconds of heaven? How many of you like to see 20 seconds of hell? I think it changes. I really do. I, that's not original by me. It, it has been said that if a person watched 20 seconds of hell, they'd never be uh, the same on earth again. If a person saw 20 seconds of heaven, they would have a different way of of wanting to live their life here on earth. So I took us to uh, uh, Paul's letter to the church at Corinth. It's his second letter. It's a very tender letter. It's a very personal letter. He loved the, the, the church there, he, people he had led to the Lord. They had, they had grown immensely. He had walked into that city with uh, no Christians there, maybe two, maybe possibly, but a city of over 100,000 people. Paul just went in there. God did a mighty work. People were being saved all over the place. Did not spend much time there, but he, uh, he always loved them. The, he he uh, wanted them to grow in the grace of God, and they did. They went from a, a very um, pagan culture to living in a pagan culture, but having a very heavenly mind. So in first or 2 Corinthians 12, we get a picture here of Paul who had a glimpse of heaven. So I thought for us ending this series on the God of the resurrection, uh, what it would be like to, to get the first hand account of a person who actually saw heaven. And it begins with a very great proverb here. So let's just go down and look at it verse by verse. God, add your blessing to your word tonight, the preaching of your word. Open our hearts. Lord, let us hear from you. Lord, if uh, we hear just words or read just words without your anointing, it will be nothing. But Lord, great, great is your faithfulness. So your word is your best for us, and let us see it tonight. Verse 1, it is doubtless not profitable for me to boast. That's a great proverb, one that we probably could live by a little bit better. There's no profit in boasting, absolutely no profit at all in the bragging of the things that we think are important. It makes us look smaller, not bigger. Do y'all like being around braggers? I don't. It's a matter of pride that can very easily become sin in our life. And he's going to be talking about something that is very personal to him, and this is the only time really we get a glimpse of it. But he said, I, I, I'm not trying to come to brag or to boast. He said, I will come to visions and revelations of the Lord. I'm going to talk about something that, that is a God-given thing. Visions are not man-made. We don't need any God vi man vision. And we don't need any man-made revelations either. We need, but I, I'm very interested in God's vision, joining that, 
And I'm very interested in the revelation that God has for us. But we don't need it from man, not at all. So here he's, and by the way, I looked in every modern translation that I could find. And in verse 1, when it says, when it comes to those, when it comes to visions and revelation of the Lord, it is the very same translation in every modern version. I say that to say this, there's not a better way to say it. Vision and revelation is an extremely good way of describing what Paul is talking about. Um, Opticea, which is where we get our word optical, it is to see or to view, vision. It means an appearance presented to one. It doesn't really matter whether they were asleep or whether they were awake, but they, they can see something. They don't have to be in a trance. They don't have to be asleep. It doesn't have to be a dream. But you can get a vision, but it means to see something. An appearance or image of something remarkable and unexpected. A vision. Revelation is different and that it is the same, by the way, same word for the last book of the Bible. It means the unveiling. Here is Thayer's lexicon's definition. To laying bare, making naked, stripping down of the things which cover so it may be seen clearly. A disclosure of truth concerning things before unknown or a manifestation. So a vision is being able to see something literally as God wants you to see it, or it may be that you get to see it through God's eyes. A revelation is God taking back the fog, God letting the sun shine through, being able to see something for really what it is. A truth, maybe there's a passage of Scripture that you have read 20, 30, 50 times, but on the 21st or the 51st time, you saw something there and you said, how did that get there? I've read this before. Somebody snuck it in when I wasn't looking. But literally all the, 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 the things that confuse are taken away where we get the, the privilege, the great privilege of seeing it for what it really is, okay? So that's what the, he's talking about. He said, I'm not trying to brag, but God has brought forward some things that, that I, I need to talk to you about. <clears throat> These visions and revelations of the Lord. <clears throat> Verse 2, he says, I know a man. Now we're going to see a, Paul kind of steps into the third person, and he's going to kind of be talking about someone as if it's not him. It's kind of like, this is Paul, but I'm going to step out of it, and I'm going to talk about him. Now, let me read the whole verse to you so I, it'll make sense to you. I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago, he knows the time, it was a, a huge, huge thing. Whether in the body, I do not know. Whether out of the body, I do not know. God knows. Such a one was called up. To the third heaven. Now, why is he using third person? It's not about him. That's why he's saying it's not profitable to boast. It's not profitable to boast. You know, if this were us, it'd be very easy for us to have a book tour, wouldn't it? We go, we go out on the speaking engagement. We'd be out and we'd be holding conferences. Come talk to me. Let me tell you about my time in heaven. We'd sell the movie rights for $10 million or $50 million, you know. By the way, people have tried that. Uh, this person who went to heaven. And, and we've heard stories of those who had glimpses. I've had stories, stories of those. R.G. Lee, that I think so very much of, the preacher that was at Bellevue that, that uh, did the Payday Someday ser sermon in uh, a place called Heaven sermon. He said he got a vision of heaven, but he didn't have any way of describing it. Now listen, here's what I want you to see this. Paul's saying this is a God-given thing. It's a God-given thing. It's not about him. It is a gift. I say that to say this. The gifts of God for us, the talent that God has given us, the things that he's given us to use for his glory is not us. It's God. It's God. Um, 
I'm a jack of all trades and a master of none. The only thing I'm good at, I'm, I'm serious, the only thing I can do is to, to be in God's word and, and to hear from him. I've had people, now I'm not trying to brag, I'm going to step out of this a little bit, but I've had people talk and say, Pastor, you, you can communicate the word of God to where I can see things in scripture that I didn't see before. And I'm very quick to tell them, that wasn't me, that was the Holy Spirit. Okay? We have no right to take credit for that which is not us. I'm going to say that again. When you're doing things, whether it's acts of kindness, right? If it's, if it's acts of service, if it's teaching, preaching, if it's, if it's being loving and kind, whatever those things are, if it's singing, and I'll tell you, musicians have it tough because their gift is so easily seen. And, and people will say, oh, you have a beautiful voice, or Janice, you can just, uh, you're magnificent on the piano. And they are, but listen, they need to understand, it's not them. They didn't get, they didn't make that voice for themselves. They didn't get that understand. I don't know how in the world a pianist can look at four lines of music at the same time. Talk about being bi-brained, right, or quadra-brained or something. I mean, I try reading one line of music, and that's tough enough, but to read four of them at once, Amen. That's not them. That's a God-given gift, right? And Paul is very plain here. He says, look, I don't know if, it, if I was literally taken there or if I was just in the Spirit, but I just want you to know it wasn't me. It was God's gift to me. He said, I, I was there and I saw it. Uh, such a one was called up to the third heaven. That's the same word that we think of that is taught to be as raptured, to be snatched up. I mean, when I was at my very first church, the kids went on a youth trip, and I was a kid myself, but I didn't go on the youth trip with them. I think I was, what, 27 when I went there? And, and they were all down front in the middle. Of, and it was a, it was a Sunday was it a Sunday morning? Yeah, it was Sunday morning. And there was about 30 kids up there, what, between 20 and 30. I don't remember exactly how many it was. And they were all sitting on the floor. And it came to the right point in time, and they all jumped up in the air and screamed as loud as they could scream. And we had people in the congregation screaming as loud as they could scream. And what they yelled was rapture practice. What they were doing is they were jumping like, and it was just to make a big deal about it. But they had, they had studied the rapture and all that kind of stuff. Folks, he said, I don't know if I was in the body or not, but I got snatched up out of this place. He said in verse 3, I know a man, I know such a man, whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows. He was caught up into paradise. Paradise. That is um, an oriental word. It's a Persian word. Um, it speaks to the Persians uh, of a place that they would have that you and I would look at it like a park, a, a state park, a, a place that was enclosed, fenced in, well-watered, manicured, all, the, all the, the flowers, Margaret, all of those wonderful things. Now, this is what they did that wasn't, kind of, that wasn't the greatest thing in the world, but they would put wild animals in there and they would hunt. Okay, so they called it paradise because it was so beautiful, but the terminology, not for the hunting and the killing of it, but the terminology lived on, and it meant uh, a grand enclosure uh, or preserve. It came to be known for uh, a part of Scripture for where the, the, the believers who died, that's where they go. They go to paradise. You may have thought of the, the term in the Abraham's bosom, Luke called it, right? Now, unbelievers, when they die, right now, where do they go? Hell. But it's also called Hades, which is Sheol, which is the place of the grave. All right? But there is a difference between where the unbelievers go and where the believers go. The believers go to a place called heaven, or here they use this term, paradise, right? But it's not the final heaven. It's not the final abode that we're going to go to. 
It's a place that we will go until the end, and at the end, there will be that resurrection, there will be the, there will be the, um, the judgment for the Christians, the judgment seat of Christ, for the unbelievers, the great white throne judgment. But for the believers, it's called paradise. So when he was called up, he was called up to the place where the believers are now, okay? Those who died as believers in the Lord. He, he, he was called up into paradise, and he heard inexpressible words. Not words that he couldn't understand. This is not non expressible words or non understandable words but it's inexpressible words he can he cannot share those words i'm going to chase a rabbit here not long there is a, a thing today that is um, uh, kind of a, a movement that was a a god-given gift that people are still holding on today and i'm not sure that they're using it bi biblically and uh on the day of Pentecost, those people that were there were sharing the gospel in their language. But other people heard, here's exactly what it says, in their own language, in their own tongue. So here is somebody who may be speaking Aramaic, but someone else is speaking some crazy language over there. But they're speaking, and something happens from their speaking to their hearing, and their hearing Literally what the Word of God says in their own language. But it became, even the, the church at Corinth really got tied up in this now, and they saw it as a prayer tongue, a prayer tongue, or speaking in God's heavenly language. I think that's quite unique. I have dear, dear friends of mine who have a prayer closet and a prayer tongue that they pray for themselves in their prayer closet. But, but the place where you're... Um, speaking in church in a, in, a, in a language that you don't know, but someone else who is supposed to be there who hears it and can interpret it, it can be very confusing. And, and God's really not the author of confusion. I'm not going to tell God how to do what he does. But here, when Paul's own testimony, when he was taken to paradise, when he was taken to heaven, he heard words. He understood, but he could not express it with the people down here. As it is in Revelation, he could translate the unveiling of it where he could share those truths with those people. Paul wasn't that smart. God would give him revelations for the people. That was the point. It wasn't just so that Paul would be puffed up, but so that people could get the benefit of knowing the Word of God without having the Word of God yet. They only had Old Testament scriptures. So understand here, he says, he was caught up in a paradise, heard inexpressible words, which are not lawful for a man to utter. Go back to 1 Corinthians 12, 13, 14, and you'll hear about how Paul talked to, trying to help the church there to understand about what they were calling tongues. He said, in verse 5, a such a one I will boast. Yet as of myself, I will not boast. Now, he said, I'll boast of the one because of the hand. Listen to me now. You listening? I'll boast of the one who has God's hands of anointing, the, the giftedness, the blessing of God upon them. That's about God. For the glory of God, for the blessings of God, for the good of God's people. But he says, of me, I won't boast. I'm not going to boast. I'm not going to tell you I'm super saint, and that's why I had this privilege. Here's where I want to go with this. He said, of such a one I will, I will boast, yet of myself I will not boast, except in my infirmities. I will boast in my infirmities. Look in chapter 11, verse number 30. If I must boast, I will boast in the things which concern my infirmities. He is not saying, you know, the world's great. I mean, it, it, y'all sure are blessed to have such a great pastor. That's not what he's saying, right? That's not what he's saying. He is saying how wonderful it is that God uses all of his people, with all the giftedness, with all the anointing, God uses all of his people. Praise be to God. 
for the glory of God in his church. But as far as me, God has done a work in my life so that, listen to me, so that these blessings could come a part of my life. If you want the blessings of God's hand of anointing on you, there's something that comes with it. Infirmities. Not a popular message. It's not a feel-good message. But it's the Word of God. Look what it says here. Verse number 6. For though I might desire to boast, I will not be a fool. For I will speak the truth. But I refrain lest anyone should think of me above what he sees me to be or hears from me. That would be foolishness. And lest I should be exalted above measure by the abundance of the revelations. Plural. Multiple revelations. Multiple times God came and unveiled truth to him where he could see it. I think of the times when the Gentiles got saved. And everybody else wasn't too good about that. You know, Acts 15, and they went back to Jerusalem, and they they were going to have this holy council there. Peter gave his testimony, and Paul brought some some, uh, uh, Gentiles with him uh, who had been saved. And by the way, and not circumcised yet. And, And they saw the evidence of God in them. There were some things that God used Paul in an amazing way. Half the New Testament was written by this man. That's not that he was the prolific writer. It's that he was used by the anointing of God in a mighty way. God could have used anyone to do that. God's sovereign. He could have chosen anyone to do that. But he chose Paul and with that choice to keep him from being lifted up in pride. He gave him Really, something that, I I hope you hear this, something that aided the power and the anointing of God in his life, he described it as infirmities. Verse 7, lest I should be exalted above measure by the abundance of the revelations, a thorn in the flesh was given to me. Just like the anointing of, you want to call it talent? The anointing of communication? The more anointing of wisdom and the visions and the revelation? In the same manner, God gave him something that went with it. He saw it as a gift. I will tell you the thing that we do when we have infirmities is we make a prayer request. We want it gone as quickly as possible. Lord, don't don't let me go through this. Don't feel bad about yourself because he says also in verse 8, I pleaded with the Lord three times that it might depart from me. It's okay, but understand, God does what's best. So with the anointing and the blessing and the usefulness comes infirmities. He describes it as a thorn in the flesh. Brother Bradley, in the present tense. Not a thorn that I had in the flesh. But a thorn that is in my flesh, that remains in my flesh. How many of you have had a splinter or a thorn? Say, ow. What's the very first thing you want? Get it out, right? I'm like yelling. I'm not yelling ow, I'm yelling, Lynn, Lynn, come get this thing out. And isn't it funny how such a small splinter can create such a great big pain? And it remains. Now what's going to happen after it remains? It's not just... So it's not just painful, it's sore, it's agonizing. You don't want to touch it. Matter of fact, if you got it in your finger, it's going to hurt your big toe. Y'all right? And it never goes away. 
And it really doesn't matter what it is. Scholars have, have wanted to, to, to put their finger on what it was in, in Paul's life. Some say it was when he got malaria in Galatia. Some said it's when he was stoned and left for dead. And I, I thought, was it Lystra or Derby uh, where he was stoned and left for dead? So as they said, maybe it was a back problem that you have. And for those of y'all who have back problems, you can probably amen that. Some say it's the vision that he had on the Damascus Road that, that he lost, he, he had bad eyes the rest of his life. I don't know. By the way, it's not important. He didn't tell me specifically what it was. Maybe it was malaria. Maybe it was cancer. I don't know what it was. But it was there, and he saw it as a gift from God. Huge. He said, for whatever reason, God has blessed me with an ability that he's going to do amazing things, let me see things, let me, let, he's going to reveal things in such a mighty way for the benefit of others. But there's a balancing act there. He calls it a messenger of Satan. A messenger of Satan. Um, Hell's representative. I mean, you may have a, a guardian angel, but you may have a, a hell's angel. And he uses the word there, a messenger of Satan to buffet. This is a verb, an action word, that means to strike with a fist. To give a blow with a fit, to, mal, to maltreat, to treat with violence, to treat with violence. Strictly for the purpose of pushing down the human pride so that the glory of God could shine through. Did y'all hear that? If he didn't bring the gift of infirmities, the pride would just over, overcome. How many of you have known someone mightily used of God who lost it because their pride took over? Of no use anymore. No use. Satan's a dirty dog. And if he can threaten with pain, he will. And evidently it works. With pain, I don't know about y'all. Do any of y'all ever grumble when you get pain? When you're sick? My mom said that she knew I was sick because it was the only time I was ever quiet. He said he quits, she quits, he quits talking when he doesn't feel good. Because I'm just, I just don't feel good, right? We want to tell everybody else about our pains. I had an aunt one time, you ask her, so how you doing? Well, I'm better. She was always getting better, but it was always because she had something going on. And she's going to tell you all the aches and pains that she had. I, think, I thought she was going to reach down in her pocketbook and come up with that scroll. You know, well, let me tell you all the things I've been going through. Y'all know those people? Aren't those people such a blessing to be around? I'm being sarcastic, which is my, my uh, spiritual gift here. Look at the last part of this. He said, because the abundance of the blessing, there's an abundance of infirmities which God allowed. It was a gift to me. God allowed it. Like, like he allowed Satan to go after Job. He allows Satan to come against us. Wow. Your name to be mentioned. Wow. And... He lets, can I say, satanic waterboarding. I mean, just to punish, to beat us down, lest I be exalted above measure. <clears throat> Y'all understand that um, there's a correlation. To the same amount of blessing, there's going to have to be a core, uh, uh, an equal amount of suffering. 
comes in different ways. It comes in different ways. Being waterboarded in Jesus' name. I put that down in my notes because I thought, when you hear waterboarding today, you, we think about torture. Some of the things that we go through. Corey Tim Boone. Does anybody here know Corey Tim Boone? Hiding place. What she went through to have a testimony that's been used for the glory of God. A preacher that I know, uh, her first time when I was a, a teenager, David Ring. Anybody ever heard of David Ring? Has cerebral palsy. He's an evangelist. He's preached all over. Um, only has one sermon. He preaches it 20 different ways or 500 different ways, but he's only got one sermon. His sermon is, is I got cerebral palsy. What's your excuse? And he always like, I, I know what I, why I've got, but you've been gifted. Why aren't you doing something for the kingdom? I think about Jim Elliott. Y'all know the missionary, Jim Elliott, who's down there for the cause of this group of people who do not know Christ at all, and they as their culture would teach them and lead them to do, killed him. So what did his wife, Elizabeth Elliot, do? Went back to the same tribe of people who killed her husband. And one of the men who, who she knew was part of the party that killed her husband came into her house only wearing a rope around his waist. And kindly, she said, this is an elegant lady, an elegant lady. You would never think about being in that tribal place. She said, why are you wearing that rope around your waist? And he, she, the man said to her, well, woman, what do you want me to do, go naked? He had no understanding, no understanding. And yet, the loss, the pain, a husband, but yet the blessings of a tribe coming to know the Lord. For whatever reason, and you don't know it and I don't know it and we don't need to know it this side of glory, God allows us to go through things that are a part of our testimony. They're part of the making of the culture of who we are. That we would not be that person without it. The things that we are actually trying to escape from are the things that are actually possibly a gift from God. Concerning this thing, I pleaded with the Lord three times that it might depart from me. And he said to me, my grace is sufficient. All you need is my grace. That we're introduced to at salvation. But we need to learn to live with every day. How many of you have gotten grace since salvation? The amazing grace of God. The thousand things that God does that we don't ever see and give him credit and glory for that are constantly around us. My grace is sufficient for you. It's personal. God's hand of anointing is for us personally. God's hand of blessing is there for us personally. Then he brings it forward. Look at the last part of verse 9. Many of you can quote this. For God's strength, my strength, God's strength is made perfect, complete, lacking nothing in weaknesses. Maybe there's this person, oh gosh, can I just tell you, I'm not trying to make this about me. When I was 17 years old, uh, Dad had been in between a church. He had resigned a church. He, had not been go he didn't have a church to go to. And we went back to the church that I went to when I was four years old, when we moved from Florida to Dalton, Georgia. And, and we went back there because Dad liked the, they, uh, the, the pastor that they had. And um, uh, then Dad, another church, snatched him up pretty quickly. But that, that, that church just loved me for some reason. And I guess it's because they knew me as the four-year-old kid, and now I'm 17 years old, and, um, and, and they just, they saw something in me. 
that, that had to be a, a God thing. So dad went on and I asked him, I said, can I stay at that church? You know, because they were going to a different part of the county and y'all know in counties that one high school doesn't like the other high school. Does, does that happen with the, all the schools you got in Hall County? Well, he said, yeah. And, and really, it was the first time that anybody ever saw me as somebody. Uh, first time they ever saw me as Brian, not Alton's son, living in the, the shadows of my very talented pastor father. And the, in, the, in the spring of the year, they had Youth Day. And the pastor of the church came to me and said, would you speak on Youth Day? And I said, sure. I didn't know better. Um, by the way, I, I study today pretty much the same way I studied for that sermon, my very first sermon to preach. It's amazing how some things change and some things don't change. And I just got up to preach a, a, a sermon, first one, <clears throat> and the pastor, y'all remember cassette tapes? This group remembers cassette tapes. Uh, this was after eight-track tapes, but it was before you know, cassette tapes. And, and he copied that thing, and he handed those things out everywhere. And people just bragged on me and bragged on me and bragged on me and bragged on me. Now, I look back on it, and I can see God trying to call me to the ministry. I can. But the reason why I didn't accept the call to the ministry then Bradley wasn't ready because I was the cockiest guy in the world. You think I'm cocky now, you should have seen me then. Brian on steroids at 17, playing sports, thinking he knew everything. Y'all don't, y'all can't see that because I'm so humble, right? Yeah, right. I'll tell you flat out, if I had been humble, if I had been humble, I'm going to say it one more time, if I had been humble, if I could have found weakness then, all the pain and the struggles and the heartache that I could have missed, they would have been changed. It would have been different. I would have still have skin as thick as a rhinoceros. I'd still have to go through things. I'd still have the scars of ministry. But my, my, my ending of high school would have been different. My college would have been different. My dating would have been different. I'd still married the same woman because God is good. But I think I could have found her a lot earlier. See, there's sometimes we go through things because our pride gets in the way. But if we can start opening, if we can start lowering ourselves, he can start raising us. What was it John the Baptist said? Come on, think about it. He said, he must increase. But what was the other part of it? I must decrease so that he can increase. By the way, how did John die? For, for standing on the truths of God that got him thrown in jail and an ungodly woman manipulated her husband into getting John's head cut off. And God allowed it. Because there was, he got glory from John's life and he got glory from his death. God gets glory from the gifts that he gives us and uses us for the, for the kingdom's sake. And he gets glory when we are, go through unbelievable trials, hard, hardships, pains, lies, agony. That makes Satan laugh, but God allows it for good. All things work together for what? Now, a lot of Christians can't handle this. But the ones that are tuning in tonight, the ones that are in this building, you know of what I speak. And I will tell you, one of the difficulties in the church today is the blessings that we have. 
the ease that we have, that we've grown comfortable for the ease, and we like the ease, and we don't want to, COVID about wrecked us. COVID's nothing. You put COVID against the first century church. They were burning Christians, tying them to a pole, burning them, and using them for street lights, feeding them the lions. Crucifixion they did to our Lord. They did it to others. They did it to Peter upside down because Peter said he wasn't worthy to be crucified in the same way that Jesus was. And we squawk. And yet the fastest growing places of Christianity is not in the United States with the great churches and the buildings and the monies and, the, and all of that. It's in the places where it is the most impoverished the places in the world where people are putting themselves out there and the power of God is meeting them there and the glory of God is, is shining because light shines best in darkness. And I'm here to tell you, that I'm not preaching about infirmities. I, I've got that sermon and it takes me three sermons to get through it. I'm going to let you guess at what they are. I, I'll bring them out to you. Look in verse 10. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in needs, in persecutions, in distresses. Look at those next three words, for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, when I am beaten down, when I am to the place where I don't think I can take another step, if I pray this prayer, I'm going to be thrown into the lion's den. And yet God allows those things. Every one of those disciples was martyred. They put the apostle John in Berlin oil, for goodness sake, and couldn't kill him. <laughs> what do you do with someone you can't kill? For when I am weak, here it is, God's strength, I'm made strong in the strength of the Lord. All right, hear me. Y'all looking? He got a glimpse of glory. He wrote half the New Testament. It stood the test of time. The Holy Spirit led him to write those words. It wasn't Paul. It was Christ in Paul. Philippians, if I live, it's for your benefit. But if I die, it's gain. By the way, he, he, he wrote that from jail, knowing that he could die at any time. He could speak. He could speak of the anointing and the blessings of God. He could speak of trials and tribulations and hardships, persecutions. He said, I'm going to read it to you again. Chapter 11, verse 30. If I must boast, I will boast in the things which confirm, which concern my infirmities. The other stuff, for the glory of God, that's not me, that's Christ. Let me just say, I have done well in my weakness. Are we doing well in our weaknesses? You know, there's a, a blessing with life. You get to live longer. Amen? But the last days are not necessarily the best days. You get to be introduced to this name, guy named Arthur, Arthur, Arthritis. Y'all know him. You lose loved ones. You feel like half of you has been cut off. You go through struggles. But those are the blessings of God. Those are what make us uniquely His. What's it going to take? I'm going to hush. What's it going to take for God to let us see these things as a blessing? 
I wished I had been humble at 17. At 21, I hit my rock bottom, and it was painful. <laughs> it was painful. But it put me back on the right road. And I'm, by, by the way, I'm still on that road. I'm a lot further down that road. But I'm still on that low road. And if God could ever use me, praise be to his name. I got more to say about this, but I don't have time. Well, I guess we'll just have to pick it up next time. Uh, actually, I'm going to probably go in a different direction next Wednesday night. So y'all pray, all right? Let me pray blessings on you. Father, thank you for loving us. Thank you for the gifts that come from your hand. Being used, I think that I can't think of a greater thing than your hand of anointing being on us to be used for your kingdom's sake. The things that you've given us that we can use for your glory. But Father, we also want to be mature enough to say that when I am weak, then I am strong. So Lord, thank you for weakness. Thank you for weakness. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.